Last week, we looked at 1 Corinthians, although we know that that wasn't the first letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. It was probably his second letter. He stayed with the people at Corinth, founded their church. He stayed with them for a year and a half. It was an interesting city, a city that had very wealthy and very poor and not a lot in the middle. It was an interesting place. They say a place with wealth but with no class, no culture. The church seemed to reflect this community. There were many divisions, but the divisions were not from the outside pressures on the church. The divisions came from within the church. There were people in the church who thought that they had the knowledge. They knew what the correct theology was, how to think about Christ, how to live their lives in the proper way. And they held that over the others because they knew how right they were. They were puffed up in their knowledge. So Paul told them in 1 Corinthians, remember chapter 13, the love chapter in 1 Corinthians. It was not a pat on the back, but a swat on the behind. It was saying, you think that you're so loving and yet you're acting in this way. That is not love. This is what love is. Err on the side of love. Believe all things, hope all things, but love is the most important thing. Well, we would have hoped that that letter took care of the whole problem with the church at Corinth, right? Surely if we were all misbehaving and, and Pastor Barbara wrote a letter back, you'd all be on best behavior after that. True? But it didn't work. So Paul went and visited the church at Corinth again. And while he was there, someone did something that greatly offended Paul, but we don't know what it is that the person did. But Paul was angry and hurt. And so he was supposed to go back to Corinth another time. But he told him in the, in the letter in 2 Corinthians that he didn't dare to go back. Instead, he wrote them a letter because he knew how harsh he would be to them and he didn't want to cause them pain or to have them cause him pain. And so he wrote a very harsh letter that we don't have and it seemed to do the trick. That the person who would offended him became apologetic, repentant, and there was peer pressure on that person from the rest of the church. And so then Paul had reports that the man was doing better, the church was doing not, not very good at all. Because in the meantime, things continued to deteriorate rapidly. Other apostles, other leaders went into the church at Corinth and they were teaching them other things. And they were speaking poorly about Paul and undermining Paul's authority. Paul called these, these apostles, you can see the Superman cape up here, the red cape, he called them, not very nicely, super apostles. I think that I am not in the least inferior to these super apostles. I may be untrained in speech, but not in knowledge. Certainly in every way and in all things we have made this evident to you. Such boasters are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is not strange if his ministers also disguise themselves as ministers of righteousness. Their end will match their deeds. So we can get the impression, even from that small snippet of 2 Corinthians, that Paul was not happy with what was happening there. Well, Paul, we know, had some kind of affliction. In chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians, he refers to this affliction, and he calls it his thorn in his side, some kind of physical ailment, although we don't know what it is, and people make all kinds of guesses as to what it could be. 
We truly do not know. But we know that it had an effect on him and that these super apostles were using it against him. In this next reading, you'll hear a little bit about that, but you will also hear hints of what other things were being said against Paul. I myself, Paul, appeal to you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I, who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I am away. I ask that when I am present, I need not show boldness by daring to oppose those who think we are acting according to human standards. I do not want to seem as though I am trying to frighten you with my letters, for they say, his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Let such people understand that what we say by letter when absent, we will also do when present. So the super apostles were saying that Paul was two-sided. He would write these harsh letters, and yet he was nice to them when they were face to face. They called Paul weak, but Paul turned that around. And he said, no, it's when I am weak that I'm actually strong. He said everything to the church in Corinth was based on Jesus' death and his resurrection. He said it could be seen that the death of Christ, the death of Jesus, was a weakness. What other God dies? And yet we know that it was actually strength for those who understand because of the resurrection. He pointed out that we all die daily, little deaths, and that those deaths are resurrected We are, we share in Christ's resurrection. And so we, when we are weak and feeling at our weakest, we're actually strong because it's at those times that we rely so much more on God and on our faith. He said in his weakness, he was strong. Go ahead, Brian. The Lord said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Paul said all of these things, acknowledging his weakness, because like the head of the Fitzgerald clan, in these letters he was reaching out his arm, making himself vulnerable to the church in Corinth, aiming for reconciliation, because he loved the people in that church so much. He wanted them to be reconciled with him and also reconciled at peace with God. Well, we don't know how all of this ended, but we do know that there were moments of reconciliation. And Paul then refers to one of these moments in his scripture. This next reading is one that amuses me a little bit because it's a little bit contradictory. He didn't want to inflict them pain, and he did want to inflict them pain. It reminds me of... um, By my last church, I was on the radio every week, and so I had to be very careful with what I said. I didn't want it to go out into the general population sometimes. Well, we're not on the radio here, and my daughter is not here. But I'm sure Sarah would be fine with me saying this. (laughs) But Sarah was here with us. She shared in music just a couple of weeks ago. She came because she was so distraught, so heartbroken, so sad because she had just broken up with her boyfriend. And I had to put on a face that was a little more sad than what I felt. (laughs) Because I knew that in the long run, this was the best thing that could happen to my daughter. And yet I hurt for her because she was hurting. Well, keep that kind of feeling in mind as you listen to this part of the letter. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, for I see that I grieved you with that letter, though only briefly. (laughs) Now I rejoice, 
Not because you were grieved, but because your grief led to repentance. For you felt a godly grief, so that you were not harmed in any way by us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation and brings no regret, but worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. So again, Paul's goal throughout this whole letter is reconciliation, bringing peace within the church in Corinth, bringing peace with himself with the church in Corinth. Well, it would be nice to say we don't have another letter after 2 Corinthians, and so that must mean, of course, that it all worked. We don't know, because we know that undoubtedly there were other letters, but we don't have those other letters. And we know the truth of that, don't we? That sometimes we will be maligned. There are times for some of us when people will say things about us that may not be completely true. There may be times, and there are times for all of us, when we are hurt by another person's actions, by another person's words, by other people's inaction when there is an injustice. We become wounded. And our human instinct tells us to either run or to stay and, stay and fight. The fight or flight instinct. Well, Paul tells us that there's another way. He tells us that in all things, we reach out our hand through the door. We reach out, make ourselves vulnerable, not knowing what the result is going to be, if there's going to be someone on the other side of that door to grab our hand. Paul wrote letters, and I would encourage you this week, if you are estranged from someone in your life, to write a note, to choose a card carefully. Remember, we don't want to be super apostles, and we have not been called in the same way as the Apostle Paul. Don't write as boldly as Paul did. (laughs) But to let whoever you're estranged from know that you are thinking about them and that you still care for them. We don't know what happened as a result of the Apostle Paul's letter. We don't know what the result will be from the other person. We do not know and we cannot predict or guarantee But by doing this, by reaching out our hand in reconciliation, we will be keeping our own personal integrity as well as the integrity of our faith. Amen.